in many ways at the time, I was probably a lot like each of you, young, ambitious, advocating for the things I deeply and profoundly believed in. Many people fall for nice-sounding words that make them feel good. Speeches are designed to make us feel good, happy, emboldened, inspired, and so on. But what might sound heartwarming and relatable is in fact more often than not the result of cynical rhetorical strategies. And feeling good has nothing to do with what's true or not. The type of grandiose language that's so common in speeches is often, if not always, used for self-interest, to get people on the speaker's side. Speeches turn into policies, and eventually, if you don't buy into the language use, it can have serious consequences for you, personally as well as professionally. We see that all over society today. Megan's speech is indicative of the person she is, never failing to put herself first, no matter the occasion. This video will show her attempts to persuade the audience with words that she reads from a script. This way, we can be sure that the speech is coming straight from the heart. Well, good evening, everyone. It is very nice to be back in the UK. And it is very nice to be back with all of you at One Young World. She says it's very nice to be back in the UK, and she could be telling the truth, because she's back in the UK on her terms now. Not like when she and Harry were part of the royal family. She told Harry she feared for her mental health, and he decided to take matters into his own hands and leave the UK. But as I've analyzed in previous videos, the things that allegedly got her to fear for her mental health were minuscule and exaggerated. Before watching the following, let's keep in mind that she's speaking to an organization, a self-proclaimed community. Thus, it's reasonable to expect to hear a lot, or at least something, about this organization or community. In theory, that is, because when Megan's doing the talking, it always seems to focus on her strong and independent achievements. Let's first hear the superficial words she has for the organization. Many times this week, look, as we just heard, you'll hear all sorts of things. Some very heavy, some very uplifting, but the resounding spirit I believe you'll hear is that you are the future. But I would like to add to that, that you are also the present. She says she would like to add to that, that they're also the present. This isn't much of an addition at all. It's merely the present future cliche. It sounds more like she's stalling before she can get to something that she would actually like to detail, like the following. It was several years ago in 2014 that I was first invited to be a counselor at One Young World. And in many ways at the time, I was probably a lot like each of you, young, ambitious, advocating for the things I deeply and profoundly believed in. The phrase, I was probably a lot like each of you, is meant to establish a superficial connection between the young people in the room and her. If you can point to a connection, it's more acceptable to start talking about yourself, in theory. And the connection is just that, superficial, because with her vowel stress and her pauses, she makes sure to emphasize the alleged qualities she admires about herself. Advocating for the things I deeply and profoundly believed in. Deeply and profoundly are both intensifiers, bringing attention to the speaker's personal qualities, not the supposed work that they've done. Megan's words are so powerful that it's heard in the room. Profoundly believed in. Next, it's time for the inevitable humble brag. People don't like braggers, but if you can brag in a humble way, it can make you seem more relatable to many people, unfortunately. Humble brag is when certain types of people use a seemingly self-critical statement to actually bring attention to their impressive qualities or achievements. In the following, notice that what Megan says, making herself seem small, could be met with encouraging responses like, Come on, Megan, we knew you had it in you. Or, Megan, you were always so talented. Humble brag can always be followed by a comforting response. And also looking around and wondering, how on earth did I get here? <laughs> Have any of you today so far had that feeling, that pinch me moment where you just go, how am I here? Oh, it's a lot. And, and at that dinner, there were about 20 to 30 of us for the counselors. And there I was, I was the girl from Suits. 
and I was surrounded by world leaders, humanitarians, prime ministers, and activists that I had such a deep and long-standing respect and admiration for. And I was invited to pull up a seat at the table. She had such deep and long-standing respect and admiration for all these people that she only had to look at the script three times while saying it. An activist that I had such a deep and long-standing respect and admiration for. This isn't the first time she shared how fascinated she is with influential people. In fact, it seems to occupy her mind quite a lot. And then I started working with World Vision um, as their global ambassador. And there's a really big push for me to work with female entrepreneurs, young startup brands, people who have a give back element to the companies that they do, and then all the influencers that I interview on this site, be it friends or you know high profile people that I reach out to. Once you hit the ground running, even if you're doing it quietly behind the scenes, which is what I've focused my energy on thus far, is meeting with the right people, meeting with the right organizations behind the scenes quietly. It's a strange coincidence how the three groups she mentions, humanitarians, prime ministers and activists, all reflect the power and influence she would would like to be known for. By pointing to them, she lets people know how she wants them to think of her. Megan's ambition goes hand in hand with teaming up with powerful people. Once on the team, it's possible for her to have the same kind of power. This is the reason why people have speculated that she married Harry to build her brand. When Oprah confronted her with this, Megan gave unreliable denials, which I've detailed in this video. Links in the description. Let's return to the profound speech, where Megan again makes sure to establish a superficial connection between the young people and her, to make her self-focus more acceptable. To her, that is. Have any of you today so far had that feeling, that pinch me moment where you just go, how am I here? Oh, it's a lot. And the pinch me moment implies that Megan was living the dream or a fairy tale. Fairy tales seem to occupy her mind. That she was living a dream and still is, is further emphasized by the dramatic exhalation, almost as if she finds the level of her supposed success exhausting. And as we all know, success is so hard. The restriction so far anticipates that these young people haven't had that moment yet, unlike her, of course. This is the one part where she doesn't have to read the script. The self-focus flows authentically and organically. She calls herself the girl from Suits. The only reason she's able to minimize her perceived importance then is because of the bigger platform that her marriage to Harry has given her now. Because previously she's made this role sound like a big deal. And, and also keep in mind, I, I've been working on my show for seven years. Um, so we are very, very fortunate to be able to have that sort of longevity on a series and for me, once we hit the 100 episode marker, I thought, you know what, I have, I have ticked this box and I feel really proud of the work I've done there and now it's time to, as you said, work, work as a team mm. with, with mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Pause has emphasized the part of the sentence you want to emphasize. Here, as expected, the emphasis is a favorite personal pronoun, I. Deep and long-standing respect and admiration for. And I was invited to pull up a seat at the table. Will we ever hear about this organization? I can't wait to find out. I was so overwhelmed by this experience. I think, I think I even saved my little paper place card that said my name on it. Um, just proof, proof that I was there and proof that I belonged. I'm glad I know the context, so that I know she's not talking about landing on the moon. Just proof. Proof that I was there. Her words. And proof that I belonged. Tie in with the previous passage where she mentioned the three groups of people, humanitarians, prime ministers, activists, whose power she wants people to associate with her without having the same credentials. Next, with words like doubting and wondering if she was good enough, she lets us know about her alleged insecurities, designed to make her seem more relatable in a room full of young people struggling with questions like these. And Megan leads the way. Because the truth was, I wasn't sure that I belonged. I was so nervous. 
Oh, I doubted myself, and I wondered, wondered if I was good enough to even be there, if what I was doing in the world, albeit important and meaningful as far as I saw it, was it deserving to have a seat at this table? Even when describing alleged feelings of doubt, she can't help but insert her own assessment of the work she was doing. What I was doing in the world, albeit important and meaningful as far as I saw it, which should make us doubt that she ever doubted herself. This speaks to personality, her sense of self-importance. Next, she uses the organization to validate her own grandiose self-perception. But one young world saw in me what I wanted to see fully in myself. They saw in me, just as I see in you, the present and the future. She says the organization saw in her what she wanted to fully see in herself, being the present and the future. First of all, this is generic and hence empty jargon. Secondly, she doesn't say that she didn't see anything in herself, because she adds the modification fully, indicating that she did see something in herself. And thirdly, the young people in the room have been reduced to a side note, literally. They saw in me just as I see in you. On a more serious note, Megan's letting us know that she sees herself as and wants to be considered the present and the future. And previously we saw how she associated with influential people to indicate the kind of power she wishes to have. In conclusion, this is very much a promise that she has even bigger platforms in mind. And I reiterate that point because oftentimes we speak to young adults about the years ahead, about what you'll do what you'll have to adopt to fix from previous generations, and also what legacy you will leave. But too often in that, we neglect the point that you're doing it now. She's not reiterating an actual point. The present future framework is a standard part of speeches. Usually it's a way of getting to the actual point, but in this speech, it's Megan's only point. It's something that anyone could say to any group of people at any time, with a minimum of preparation. There's nothing specific about the organization yet. Come to think of it, it reminds me of this answer, demonstrating the huge effort she made to fit in with the royal family. It's well known you've championed the empowerment of women and young girls and promoting their self-worth. How do you hope to continue that work with the Royal Foundation? Um, yes, I mean, I think that knowing that I've, I've just been here for three months, right? <laughs> and in that You've amount of time, for, well, but with that said, for me, it's very important to, once you hit the ground running, even if you're doing it quietly behind the scenes, which is what I've focused my energy on thus far. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Sadly, I can't. Oh. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say, you know, if, if, if we know how... You here, in this present moment, this is where it's all beginning. Repetition of the word present and generic talk about beginnings. And instead of saying anything specific, Megan continues with a personal narrative, the pathos moment of the speech. Every manipulative speech has to have a touching moment where the speaker becomes strangely serious all of a sudden, so that it's all quiet and intense. The first year I joined the delegation in Dublin, I worked with a young woman from Eritrea. And she described how she had escaped her home country. I still remember it so well. I remember my shock. I also remember her courage. My recognition of how much continues to go on each day with so many turning a blind eye. And yet, despite all odds, she, like so many, still persevered. In political rhetoric, it's recognized that personal narratives resonate more with people. Aside from, unfortunately, the necessary appeal to emotion, a narrative is a way of getting from the micro to the macro. As Megan does here, she goes from talking about the woman she met to how much goes on each day. You'll hear politicians use this kind of rhetoric all the time. They visit someone, maybe someone working in a factory, and then talk about how that experience allegedly made them realize something, made them want to change something. In the vast majority of cases, it's not true, of course. But then again, what does truth matter next to feelings? This guy is more honest about what he feels or doesn't feel. Kevin, uh, your dog just died. 
The micro-macro is a common structure for speeches. Notice how Prince Harry uses a photo, micro, to get to a bigger point, macro. For me, there's one photo in particular that stands out. On my wall and in my heart every day is an image of my mother and Mandela. Straight away what jumped out was the joy on my mother's face. The playfulness, cheekiness even. Yet in that photo and so many others, he is still beaming still able to see the goodness in humanity. Not because he was blind to the ugliness, the injustices of the world, but because he knew we could overcome them. And these historic weather events are no longer historic. More and more, they are part of our daily lives. And this crisis will only grow worse, unless our leaders lead. In the last part of the passage, it sounds like she's talking about herself through the woman's narrative. Not because the specifics are the same, but because the conclusion is the same, persevering against all odds. Megan decides that this is enough pathos for now, because she's not done detailing her achievements. I followed up that trip, as David mentioned, to joining the delegation again in 2016 in Ottawa. I was very lucky to receive a day off of filming specifically to take a quick flight from Toronto up to Ottawa and to be able to join this work again for One Young World. I joined you in London in 2019, and by that point, it's fair to say, my life had changed rather significantly. I was now married, and I was now a mom. Megan casually makes sure to allude to her busy schedule as an actress. Not that we ever doubted that, of course. I was very lucky to receive a day off of filming specifically. It's interesting to note the importance with which she presents the information about herself. While the vast majority of people would make it a side note in this context, she makes it the focus of the sentences. The speech is so devoid of specifics pertaining to the organization that standard information about being married and being a mom is made central, listed as achievements. They are achievements, but not in this context. The deliberate pause she makes invites applause, which she obviously enjoys. I am thrilled that my husband is able to join me here this time. <laughs> to be able to see and witness firsthand my respect for this organization, this incredible organization, and all that it provides as well as accomplishes. One Young World has been an integral part of my life for so many years before I met him. With this generic word choice, she could have been talking about any organization. She says all that it provides as well as accomplishes, not what it's actually provided or accomplished. This organization, this incredible organization. This is an act of self-repair, here choosing to add a positive adjective. But adding all the positive adjectives in the world doesn't take away from the fact that she hasn't said anything specific. As a result, it sounds like overcompensation at this point. And then notice this very interesting formulation. I am thrilled that my husband is able to join me here this time. To be able to see and witness firsthand my respect for this organization. She makes it sound like what it's felt like since the beginning. That this is a display of respect, a display of admiration for self-interest. That's what it's about, showing that she's there, speaking to a group of young people, which gives extra points. This also explains why she's overemphasized all the right words, but with absolutely no depth or weight to them. The next part's a study in how to distort the truth. So, to meet again here, on UK soil, with him by my side makes it all feel full circle. Her need to verbalize how perfect everything is, is constant. Only Megan can know how perfect she feels inside. But linguistically, we know that people who consistently overemphasize how proud, strong and brave they are, do so because, one, the opposite's the case. That deep down, they don't feel good about themselves. This is also known as overcompensation. And or, two, because they want to prove their critics wrong, but they end up trying too hard. Certainly, considering the circumstances around and consequences of Meghan and Harry leaving the UK, the words full circle don't come to full mind. Circle. The vague buzzwords continue, more superficial than ever. And just as a sidebar, earlier this afternoon we sat down with a few of you delegates 
And it was incredibly inspiring, the resounding themes that came up about representation, about inclusion, about access, and about trying to shift the global perspective for all of us as a global community to one of curiosity over criticism. Representation, check. Inclusion, check. Access. That's a new one, isn't it? Maybe it's just me. Global times two, check. Never mind word definition so that people actually know what you mean, check. Let's finish with the only point she's made. That's not a point. The important work can't wait for tomorrow. And this week the world is watching as you cement your place in history by showcasing the good that you are doing today in the present moment as we embrace the moment of now to create a better tomorrow. And with these specific, original, and totally unpretentious words, it's time to end the video. If you liked it, subscribe for more videos and click the like button.